Hello, everyone. This is Kevin Kimball. This is Callan. And this is Katie. And you are listening to episode three of Hot Rods of the Sky. Hello, everybody, and thanks so much for listening. Uh, Once again, we want to thank everybody for their kind words and their reviews and sharing. But uh, kind of a featured huge thank you that we have this week is to Aircore Library for featuring us in their email blast this past week. We got a lot of new people interested in it, and you know we got a few emails and definitely got some movement on there, so thank you guys so much. This episode is part two of our GB Model Z series. If you guys haven't listened to part one yet, just take some time, go back and listen to it, or if you just like to live on the edge, jump in with us and hang on, I guess. Um, tonight, we have a very special guest, Jeff Eicher, and he is going to chat with us tonight. Jeff, how you doing? Good, thanks. How are you, Katie? <laughs> Doing good, thanks. Now, why is Jeff here is a great question. Um, Jeff Eicher and my dad, Kevin, built an amazing replica of the GBZ in the mid-90s, and he's here to just chat about it with us because it was, you know, a huge project for the two of them back then, and, you know, we're excited to hear about it. So the replica you guys did in started when and finished when? Well, geez, Kevin, I guess we started it in late 92, right, is when we first started talking about it? Yeah, it was It was um, about the time of Hurricane Andrew, because uh, I the, the, way, the way I remember it is I, when you went out to go see that project, Andrew was going. That's when out. Hurricane Andrew was yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So from about 92 to 96 is uh, so about four yeah. years of it. So why the Z and not something else? Um, well, it actually... Why not a Spezio two-holer? It, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it started out as actually something else. Um, right, Jeff? You know, you and I were... We, yeah. we saw Delmar fly and we thought, oh, man, that was cool. Um, but, you know, he's he's got a an R-series GB. There's a Z already that exists, so... Yeah, we won't do something like that. What if we built an airplane that we might have built if we were alive in the 30s? And that's really where Jeff and I started. So, you know, yeah, I'm so glad that didn't work out because <laughs> as it as you look at back at it, so many of the airplanes that were done with that philosophy, they're just not noteworthy. You know, nobody really cares that much about them. So I really am glad we stuck to, to doing something historic. And it was that ad in sport aviation in the classifieds. Remember that? Yeah. The guy out in Arizona right. who was, uh, you know, living in the last lot, eight years of his life, he was never going to finish it, advertised a project. And I went out and looked at it, not very close, but we had it shipped back here, it turned out to be junk, but that was the catalyst for the whole thing. Once we got into it, there was no turning back. Yeah. Once, once we, we found got a out- great set of, Clemens plans exactly it had, <laughs> for four thousand bucks. It, yeah, it had a really nice set of uh, Vern's plans and a bunch of wasted tubing and and um, not very good wood parts, and that was it. it. But it was enough to sink the hook on both of us for the Z. At that point, we we're just like, okay, you know, we're going to do this. Let's do it right. And then that's when the the research really started. But to answer the question as to why the Z2, it actually goes for me deeper than that. I was up at Oshkosh at the 91 golden age of air racing, the first one they did, which there was actually very few of those airplanes that flew. Uh, Yunkin flew Mr. Mulligan and Carl Pascarell flew uh, the Waddell Williams number four. Other than that, it was all pretty much static, but it made a huge impression on the people that saw it. And those airplanes just, you know, to see a GB, Delmar and uh, and, and uh, Steve Wolf's wasn't finished yet, but it was all fleshed out. And to see Jim Jenkins' little uh, Warner-powered airplane, they just have an aesthetic, a mystique about them that just no other airplane has. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know uh, how else to put it, but I think it was Granny Granville that was – the George Martin of the Beatles of the of the Granville brothers, everybody that was associated with that, with him there, 
produce something that was just far greater than than anything that uh, aesthetic wise and excitement wise, mystique wise that that any of those people produced afterwards. I would agree. Yeah, it was. It definitely set the the mark and and became the image of that golden age of air racing. Also, Kevin, I think if I'm if I want to be honest about it, watching the Rocketeer <laughs> uh, definitely <laughs> uh, you know sunk the hook in even more. Oh, absolutely, I mean, seeing that movie and and just uh, you know the airplanes operating and flying and a lot of cool airplanes, not just the GB, but for it to be the centerpiece was pretty pretty cool. And you know you can't you can't forget the the line of uh, the mechanic PV when. It's coming back to land after the flight, and he got shot up, and and it's smoking like crazy. And he stands up and he says, "Something ain't right," <laughs> you know. So it's just like, oh, this is this is a very very good film, and it was fun, and it kind of really you know, brought to life again, you know, the that era, that type of airplane. Well, and uh, for me, as like. Um like a dumb little kid watching this movie. I honestly thought, and I told everyone I knew, that that was y'all's GBZ. <laughs> until I said it to Dad, and he was like, God, no, no. <laughs> He's like, we did a different one here. Look at this one. That's closer to a CTO2 <laughs> yeah. hole. <All> right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that airplane is it kind of like a deal that um, conversations that we had early on in building this airplane, the Z, with... Guys like Yonkin and, um, you know, Davison and, and Clevenger and all those guys that had built some of these things. And we we got a lot of input telling us that we should make the wing longer and make it thicker and do this and change that and make it different. You know, who's going to know? Nobody knows. There's nobody around that could tell you different. And one of the things that, that we really saw and realized is that Delmar and Steve's airplane – the R2 flew really well. It was built pretty damn close to what it was supposed to be. Yonkin's airplanes were built as they were supposed to be, and they flew really well. And some of the other replicas that were, uh, you know, incorporated all these changes and make it better because we have to know better than the old guys back then, they flew like crap. So that was one of the motivating things for Jeff and I to try to make this airplane as aerodynamically and structurally accurate as we could. Yeah, Kevin, I think that both of us from the very beginning um, were committed to it because we knew that e both of us were each committed to not making it a compromise in in quality in, in any way. I mean, we knew we couldn't go with the original propeller. We knew we had to put hydraulic wheels and brakes on it. But other than that, we really tried to go full throttle, full out and do it the best we possibly could. You know? Yeah, and the, and the only thing we really changed structurally was to incorporate the 1932 R1-R2 spar upgrades on the wing spars into the wing of the of the Z. Other than that, we you know we took a Granville Brothers designed fix for the wing spar and put that right in ours, which is something they would have done mm -hmm. if they built a new wing for it. So we didn't reinvent it; we just used more tools that they developed after and put it in the structure. Other than that, it's as close as we could get. So let's go back before the Z. <clears throat> so, Jeff, how did you get started in airplanes, and how did you and Kevin meet? Well, my my dad learned to fly on the GI Bill after the Korean War, and so I grew up, you know, getting airplane rides. In fact, I think I rode with my mom when she, I was still in her. In a Cessna uh, or a Taylor Craft or something like that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but that was up in Pennsylvania. And so I, we always grew up with it, and we never had enough money to do it well. But, you know, every every ride was savored. Every air show, every fly-in memory was savored. And there was always that desire to really do it. And uh, my dad was able to put up enough money to, to buy a, a newly restored champion 7FC tri-champ, and that's what I learned to fly on, and uh, soloed on my 16th, got my license on my 17th, you know, what, I, what all people do. 
And uh, I had a whole year between soloing and having my license. And I was just obsessed with aerobatics. And I was doing all kind of aerobatics with this tri champ. The joke was <laughs> that the three wheels up was the was the symbol of Flagler County Airport. Because I'd be in the pattern <laughs> doing stuff. Uh, I can't believe I didn't get busted back then for a number of things, actually. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, then um, my dad got involved. It was always involved in projects, steerman projects. Um, and he and uh, his partner bought three Kristen Eagle kits. And um, the first one was the seventh one to fly. That, that, in fact, the manuals been, what, weren't even done at Around the time. 78 or so, Jeff? And that when the Eagle came out? Yeah, that would have been, yeah, 78. Uh, and to get the airplanes to Oshkosh, the... Uh, Frank Christensen had changed the canopy design, but didn't have the manuals done yet. So he flew down with Ivan Gleed in a Cessna 340 to uh, Daytona Beach to install the canopy on on that Eagle. Wow. And uh, and I was fortunately lucky to, to break into competition with it. You know, it wasn't enough airplane for what I was flying, but I, I did really well with it. But then the money ran out. It's always... With me, it was always this thing of wanting to do it, then the money runs out, then you start saying to yourself, well, you know, maybe I should maybe I should just focus on other things. And that's happened several mm-hmm. times in my life. In fact, it's probably in the middle of happening right now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's how uh, I got pretty established. It, my dad built a hats biplane, and um, I was up flying – with a mutual friend of Kevin's, Pat Kivikowskis. And Pat had been flying his big model sailplane at Jim and Kevin's field. Uh, and I hadn't been in there at all, I don't think, at that point. I'd been to Bob White's, but not in there. And he says, let's go in and see Jim. And I said, okay. So we landed there. And I pulled up, and Jim was there, you know, with his blue coveralls and everything. And uh, my dad and I had <laughs> talked about uh, you know, a monocoupe would be an interesting airplane, especially because Byron Trent, my dad's partner, really planted that seed. What a great airplane they were. Uh, and I just asked Jim, I said, do you happen to know if there are any monocoupe projects for sale? And he said, there's one in that hangar right there, <laughs> which was unbelievable. And that was Eddie's uh, airplane. And we bought it and restored it. And, uh, you know, I got Kevin involved in in helping with all the sheet metal on that. And uh, after that was done, you know, the airplane won a lot of awards and went, took it to all the fly-ins and stuff. And boy, when you get that kind of attention, you don't want it, you, you just don't want it to drop, you know. And you can only take an airplane to a fly-in first once. And uh, so it, I was really motivated to, to keep going and doing something. And that's really how we, we started doing the, the GB. Yeah, and the timing for that, sheet metal work on the wheel pants and cuffs and everything on the monocoupe. Um, Cal, and that was not long before you were born. Um, Cause I can, I can remember Jeff inviting us down for dinner at the restaurant and, and Robin was pregnant. <coughs> and, um, yeah. and uh, so she, you know, she's the drinker of our family and, you know, she couldn't drink. And so, I, and <laughs> she's not a drunk. She just happens to be the one that likes to drink more than the rest of us. But, and anyway, uh, yeah, she's got she's got a new drinking buddy in uh, me. She, yeah, she's fine. So, she's not anyway, alone anymore. Uh, yeah. you know, Jeff mm-hmm. said, "Here, try this," and it was grappa, and that was something new for me. That um, it was it was pretty strong. So I can remember that that night coming down there and be, visiting with him and having dinner. It's um, but you know, <laughs> the that that monocoupe that was Mister Eddie's, you know, it, who we did the black stagger one for. Um, I never actually flew in it. I don't think I ever, not, not when Eddie had it or when you had it. I don't think I've ever been in that one. No, I think I took you up because I remember we pulled the power off. I wanted to show you how oh, well yeah. it glided. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't do. come down. Okay. And we flew over Dave's place. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that had been at the time before or after the two clip wing monocoupes? Or at the same time? Uh, it was about the same time, because I think, uh, Jeff, I think you guys had the airplane at Sun and Fun when we had McCullough's airplane there. Right. And so those two monocoupes were almost, you were painting red on it when we were doing the sheet metal right. work. Okay. And then the yellow one came after and, that. Um, so, but Sim's airplane came later. Right. 
three or four years later. Okay. Yeah, about the same time. You know, so it was it was a good time for all that because you know we all had monocoop on the brain, so it made it pretty easy yeah. to to work work on situations you know together and, and it was really interesting to get the those sheet metal parts from Jeff and fix them. It it's you know the 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 metal wheel pants and the metal gear cuffs and everything that go down into the wheel pant. And they were all made by Hill Streamliners, which we mentioned before about helping out the Grand Bulls and most of the racers building the sheet metal. And that's who made those parts on that airplane. They were original parts. And it was really interesting to see how they made them, um, the techniques they used. And, and it was pretty good education because it it wasn't as you would have thought where they, you know, the way that we typically do it today or Yunkin does where you take a one piece and you try to get this whole side of the cuff figured out they took a flat piece of metal put a bunch of slits in it and then fanned out the pieces to make the current yeah, pie slices and then, and then it welded yeah. in a whole bunch of pie slices to add in the metal wow. so it was a lot of a lot more welding and a lot more you know hammer work and finish work for them hmm. so interesting just another one of those examples of there's you know there's a thousand ways to do it and you just have to pick away and <laughs> stick to it but uh, yeah, that's really that would have been ninety one ish, yeah. And then about a year later, I guess, is where the the Z kind of started to take place. Yeah, ninety two was the year that both monocoups were at Sun and Fun. Okay, so that was spring. So spring of ninety two, and then by August of ninety two. Yeah, by August, that's when Hurricane Andrew hit, and I was out looking at that project. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, um, then it got it back, and then you know we figured out it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. So then we um, we just started doing research, and Jeff was collecting everything we could. This is you know this is pre cell phones, pre internet, you know everything else. So it's it's phone calls and letters and a lot of chasing going around. Stone tablets. Stuff. Yeah. A lot of stone tablets. Yeah. I, I gotta chisels. tell one one of the funniest memories of this of this whole project for me was. I, I was dealing with some kind of blueprint printing company downtown Orlando and mentioned to them that we needed to somehow digitize those Vernon Clements drawings into a bitmap so Kevin could do the vector ra- raster thing on top of it. And the guy says, I'd love to be a part of that. I'll do it. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I brought him the... The, the plans down there and I just uh, Kevin how many disc discats were, was that on I mean it was it was, it was, a sta- it was like a, a file bo- the back a, end was so huge yeah a file box full of <laughs> you know 1.44 three inch three and a half inch floppies I was gonna say well but what was it just like 30 megabytes uh, but it's just in a ton I don't of know, little but- things yeah, you know, this isn't. But you were on the phone with me when you tried to first load part of it in, and it appeared for like a second and a half, and then disappeared. Remember yeah, that because yeah. your memory crashed. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a tough time. You know, that back then, you know, using AutoCAD, I think I was eleven, or, or maybe before, mm-hmm. but it was it was pre Windows, and so everything that you did, you had to remember the exact file name, where it was and everything. So if it was, you know, the the floppy was an A drive, you had to have A colon backslash, blah, 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 and type in, type out every character right for the file name. And then it would open. You couldn't just look at it on a big list. It was kind of, everything was a pain in the ass. So um, it got, it got easier as we worked through this particular project, as the technology got better on the software and the computers got better. But, um, so you got the it, it took, the, it took, the first it took, project, yeah, yeah, and then you started your research mm-hmm. and hunting down and going to every possible thing you you could. Yeah, was the was the project just something cool for you two to do, or did you have in mind maybe somebody will come along and and buy it before it's finished? I, I planned on flying it actually in the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, I still wonder if I should have or not. There's a lot of factors that went into it, some things that needed to be worked on after the original test flights that Del Mar did. Uh, but also, you know, um, Kevin and I saw Charlie Hillard flip his uh, sea fury yeah. on the back at Sun and Fun that spring before yeah. the GP flew. And 
you know, that made a pretty big impression on me. I, I got to say, I mean, that that is not a that's not a person I expected to have a landing accident and end up dead over it. Yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and things in your business were at a point where you needed to to focus on that a lot too, rather than flying the airplane. But it, yeah, exactly, and also, you know. I went down to Pompano Air Center to because I haven't been flying. I'm not a builder and flyer. I've got to be either doing one or the other, not both. Some <laughs> people can do both. Some people can keep an RV6 project going for 25 years and actually finish it. <laughs> I can't. It's got to be all and then finish the goal and then move on. But anyway, I haven't been flying since the whole time we were we had been working on this airplane because the monocoupe got sold and I've I was hardly even going over to see my parents and to fly the hats. So I went down to Pompano to get some time in a pits again and uh, to do learn some wheel landings in the pits because I figured that would be kind of close, as close as we could surmise anyway. Uh, but anyway, I went down there and, you know, I had gone to the World Aerobatic Championships in uh, 1996 in Oklahoma City, and that was the third time I had seen the – Russians fly the Sukhoi and I was just smitten by the airplane and and you know I mean it just like I don't know if I'll ever what kind of a level that I will achieve with that airplane but I want to at least spend some of my life trying to figure that thing out because at, at the time especially it was leagues ahead of any everything else you know and it's still it's actually still competitive today yeah. uh, <clears throat> in a lot of ways but um so you know, I came back from Pompano and got to fly that Sukhoi down there. Brian let let me fly it as a commercial flight, flight instruction flight. And uh, I was just taken by it and said, you know what? This GB is too pretty to bang up. And I really want <laughs> I really want to start flying competitive aerobatics again. So the, that's basically what happened there for me. And then you ended up buying a Sukhoi 29. Right. Yeah. And I remember the one time you took me for a ride in it and you said, you know, we're flying around. I'm kind of looking around north of our place up here, you know, pretty far up over the, the woods out there. And um, you said, you want to see what it can do? And I said, yes. And then next thing I know is like, uh, 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 you know, and then a few, few four seconds of that, it was like, OK, we that's that's good. Uh, I've seen enough. <laughs> I don't want to have to walk. Yeah. 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 But it was such an yeah, aggressive we, we, we would do training camps with one of the great Russian flyers, Nikolai Timofeyev. And in the he would work us so hard that in the morning we would see him drive up and said, shit, he showed up today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nick's a, Nick's a great guy. And you know, we all became yeah. friends because of those airplanes. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the the research you guys did. I know there's a you guys talked to everybody you possibly could who was still alive or who heard about or was in the building. Um, let's just talk about some of that because well, I know there's. Go ahead. I was going to say we 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 did everything we could to find every magazine article, every story, every photo, things like that, and and so many of the articles are wrong and had a bunch of, you know, propaganda stuff in them, but there might be one little nugget in there that was of value. So we, we took all that typical stuff. Typical media. Say again? I said it was typical media getting 99% of it all right. wrong. Yeah. But it, you know, it's the sensational stuff about the airplanes. Um, and we, we were able to take all that, put it all together and, and filter it all out. And it's just, you know, the two of us sitting, sitting there and, logically going through all that stuff and, and understanding the points of view and everything. And then, um, Jeff, we learned about, you know, we met, um, Dick Blakeney, um, some of these other guys. And we, we learned about the Granville reunion that was going to be going on up in, in Concord, New Hampshire. Right. And at, yeah. the, at the air show there. And, and so you and I flew up there and we got to meet a whole bunch of GB groupies from around the, the country or the world and and also a lot of the the surviving family members employees um you know um children of the granvilles and really got to 
to learn a lot from those folks there. Yeah, that was a great experience. And then this is kind of a weird thing, but when I did my private check ride, the guy, the examiner, knew who I was before I walked in the building because of the Z. He put on the air show when you guys went up there to, for the reunion for the Grand. Oh, really? He put the show on. Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we talked about the GB for the oral of my private check ride. And, oh, yeah, let's talk about some airplanes. Let's go fly. Yeah. So it was because of the Z. It was kind of neat. Yeah, that's neat. I don't even it, remember what his name was. was. Because um, the family, uh, Delmar let the family push the airplane around anytime it needed to be moved. Uh, and it was really cool to see the, the family actually, because they had kind of distanced themselves from that, you know, because they had bought into some of the, I think some of the P, bad PR too over the years. Sure. And I mean, it was a fascinating part of their history and everything, but they didn't go out of their way to embrace it. Right. And uh, it's, it was so cool to see them really reconcile with that past themselves. And, you know, I, Delmar and, and, um, and Steve have so much to do with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know, the R model is the one that's the Mount Everest of, you know, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the GB mystique and, um, yeah. you know, mystery of, of fate and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And some of the people that we met there were, um, we met Gladys Granville Jones, who is uh, the baby sister of the Granville brothers. She was the, the, the Granville sister. And then her husband is Hiram Jones. And he was a guy that welded all the fuselages and landing gear, all the steel parts. Um, I remember meeting him. He was in a, a wheelchair at the time. Primo Galetti and his wife, uh, Lydia, and we got to meet um, uh, Norma Granville. Um, we got to meet Bob Hall's sons. Uh, who else? I mean, there was just a bunch, yeah. of, a bunch of them that were the that a lot of the folks aren't with us anymore. And it was just, it was pretty. Cool. Norma Granville was the first female hematologist in the United States. Oh, I didn't. By the way, so that's that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we love a, a good female. Uh, I'm going to restart that <laughs> sentence because I could not think of the word that I wanted to say. Uh, wait, what year was that? That she was like, what year did she become the first female hematologist? Oh, I don't know. She was in her late 80s, right? Yeah, seven years. Kevin, when we were sure. up there. Yeah. Yeah. So it must have been 50s, like, 60s, 60s, maybe, or something. Six, yeah. yeah, 60s. 50s, you can look yeah. it up. That's actually really, that's actually really impressive. Um, I mean, and Jeff, you got to you got to talk to um, Gordon Agnoli, right? Uh, the the sign painter that painted all the trim on the airplane. Um, yes, you had a, yeah. a phone call, I believe, with him. Um, right. Yeah, and he's the one that his memory was fading to the. I don't know how much I really got out of that. Yeah, but it's just he did say red. I, I remember that, which <laughs> is not what we really wanted to here but you know rustoleum is red too so <laughs> well and that, and that's where some of those notes that that primo took on the drawing when he sat down with uh, the brothers in various times and wrote things down it said red pinstripe you know um so how is it written on there red pinstripe on black gave brownish color or something there's a note in there so uh -huh. we uh, yeah. you know the the reds of the day were very were a bleeding kind of a color you couldn't put red mm -hmm. underneath anything yeah. and bleed up through it so the red had to go on last yeah. and so it's either on top of the yellow or top of the black and so it's going to Yeah and the yellow's bleeding through there too so there you have brown right. definitely right well, and since we're on paint, I have a question because a lot of the, obviously a lot of the videos, photos, things like that are all black and white. So how did you guys know, obviously if it's yellow and black, black is black, or I'm probably wrong with that. Black's never a simple black, but how did you find the right yellow? And also, how are you sure that you got the right yellow? Go ahead, Kevin, because that's a good one. Well... <laughs> Yeah, the part of it that I remember is that we, we we knew it was yellow. The records show that it was yellow. And we knew it was loaning yellow. And uh, we learned through some research that it was uh, Barry Brothers Barreloid dope that was on it, which was, you know, kind of like saying DuPont today or something like that. It was a, you know, it's a good color. 
a good brand. And we actually have a friend in, or, in Orlando who is kind of a historian and of this, th- all kinds of cool things. And uh, actually a, a model collector, model engine collector and an old balsa model collector. And uh, he was always coming around and visiting uh, Walt Griggs, his name. And Walt said, uh, well, I have a, a Barry Brothers original dope card that's been in a black envelope and filing cabinet for decades. I can bring it out if you want to match <laughs> the color to it. And so there it was, Loaning Yellow. Loaning was a, a brand of airplane in the day, and they had a particular yellow that was theirs. A lot of the airplanes back then that were going to be flying in rough country or were going to be cross-country trips with mail, those types of things, they would paint the top wing either bright red or bright yellow, at least one of the top mm-hmm. wings, so that when the airplane crashed en route somewhere, it would be easier to spot <laughs> it. It wasn't if it would crash. It was just like when it crashed. When? when? Yeah, we needed to go when get the mail. So that was... Well, we were, we were really... <laughs> We're we're interested in the mail, right. not the pilot. Yeah. Cool. What, we, yeah. what surprised us though is how much more beautiful the Barreloid version of Loaning Yellow was compared to what Randolph, the current dope uh, <clears throat> manufacturer, was was selling as as uh, Loaning Yellow, which is more of a greenish tint. Yeah, it was kind it, of. It was absolutely it was ugly. beautiful. Yeah. It, yeah, but. yeah, and I've actually seen on a, a couple other replicas. I was kind of looking through today. There was one in the seventies, and I think like I watched a video of it, and like it said seventy nine was the. Yeah, date. that's the one. That's but in the, the yellow too. looked okay. The yellow looked more pale, like kind of like um, mm. like like butter, uh, not quite butter, almost, but like you you know. The Z you guys did was it's a very deep, strong yellow, kind of like what's in the JKE Works logo. And that one, I don't know that maybe it was the camera too, but it just seemed a little bit like a, a little pale and yeah, just different. Lighter. I don't even know what color yellow they used on on that particular airplane. This one it was built by Bill Turner in California, um, but mm-hmm. and and that's the one that you know really what we were talking about earlier. It was. A couple of feet longer, more wingspan, thicker wing, more you know, and used a, a twin beach engine mount and used um, you know PT twenty two landing gear components and so it just it, you know it didn't work as good as the actual airplane did in its short life, but um, it didn't work as good as that. So that's what was one of the airplanes that motivated us to do it as close to original as possible. Well, I actually learned a fun fact because I was watching old videos of you guys during the maiden flight. Um, each of you guys did a little yeah, interview. Yeah, she called them. She, she called them newsreel Jess. photo video. Oh my god! I didn't know what it was. <laughs> newsreel. Okay. I didn't know was, it was. It was just. It was just Ann Byers, you know, recording us in the nineties in ninety six. <laughs> but to her, it's like, you know. From- well, it was on film. <laughs> okay. <I'm sorry. laughs> Um, anyway, but I learned from Jeff today that the original Z only flew for 106 or 107 days, or like was only, because at first he said 120, and he was like, actually, I think it was 107, and I was like, okay, 107 it is. Yeah, it's pretty sure. It was flying. Yeah. 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 It was May May to December. Well, they they flew it in August 26th was the the first flight, right? Bob Hall's birthday. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then it crashed on December Mm. 5th, so... It, it wasn't around yeah. that long. And, you know, today when somebody mm-hmm. builds an airplane, a home built or, or a replica of something, you either have 25 or 40 hours you have to fly as a test period you know, <laughs> in a little tiny circle, 25-mile um, circle, stay close to yeah. home, make sure everything works. You know, they did two or three flights with this and then took off and headed to the races. It probably, by the time it got to the races, it probably had less than 10 hours on it. It was brand new. So yeah. they're still trying to figure out how everything was going to work. Didn't have time to still do got that new testing. airplane smell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and then so then we, you know, we just started building, started drawing stuff up, and started building pieces. And um, Jeff worked on collecting up instrumentation and other things like that too. You know, we just kind of kept chasing things around. We, we had, yeah, our about airplane the- had an original panel. I mean, if you look at, at our panel, it looks exactly like the original did. We didn't use modern 
um, instruments and make concessions there at all. And I, I so think our- in the Hughes uh, Racer project, we were the first and only ones to have done that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's... So the instruments that are in there, there's a couple that are real large face instruments. Are those truly large face instruments or is there some trickery that was done to make it look large faced? Trickery. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're modern. They're, they're modern. Well, when I say modern, post-World War II, but they, we had a guy that was able to make those cases to make it look bigger and then make longer uh, hands and uh, bezels and everything to make that work. It, it was, oh, Kevin, wasn't, wasn't that guy like on the, ver- I mean, he was getting out of it when we, yeah. when we approached him about doing it and we just barely got the stuff before he was gone. Yeah. He, he we barely yeah. got our stuff and then he kind of absconded with a whole bunch of other people's money after that. I think he kind of, you know, took off. Yeah. We were lucky on that, but, it, but he did a hell of a job. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a brand new, <laughs> he's a thief, but he does a great right. job. Right. It was brand new big instruments that he made according to the original designs. Just had World War II style guts in it. Guts. Yeah. So cool. that's, And then the, the instrument panel was raw aluminum on the original. It was engine turned. But one thing that we noticed when we stared at the photographs a lot is that it, it wasn't the typical engine turning of the little, which is where you take a brush and you spin and you make that little swirling effect on the metal um, that you see sometimes in, in like a holographic decal today or uh, on the cowling of the Spirit of St. Louis, that type of thing. So it normally it's just done in horizontal rows. Well, this one, you could see in the pattern on the, on the photographs that it was actually uh, around the circumference and spiraled in and got ever smaller, smaller, smaller as it went to the center where the vent was. And... So what we ended up doing that was that was the first ever thing I ever had any any interaction with a CNC program and a friend with uh, with a machine shop had a very very early you know computer controlled knee mill and we set it up on that with Craytex abrasive and WD forty and set it up there and just you know and had it go around and do the pattern and, and swirl the panels so that's how we did that. But you know we so on. Go ahead. On the um, little drawing you you had from the who did the little drawing that had all the little information, little snippets and Primo Galetti. Primo Galetti. So you basically had some napkin notes on some of the basic stuff. How how did you decipher the rest? Like how did you figure out the rest of it? Because there's not very much information. Oh, there was one real important document that we did come across, and it was a paper that Bob Hall presented to the Society of Automotive Engineers in October of '31 at the Waldorf Astoria at the, the National Convention. And basically, it was like a white paper that he he gave a lecture on the the structure and the design of the airplane because it was the fastest thing on the planet. You know, it was it, cars yeah. were. Cars are not moving compared to this thing. So in, in that article, which is available um, out there, and it's it, he described uh, the spacing on the wing ribs being 5.4-inch centers, compression members being 27-inch centers, steel ailerons, uh, welded-up steel tube tail feathers. You know, X4130 was, you know, uh, experimental almost at that time. It was so new, and it had X4130 tubing in the structure for the extra strength. He talked about how big some of the tubes were in the fuselage, so the truss members and things like that, what they did with the engine, how much fuel it had. So all these things were really big clues, and then when you sit there and start just sketching that out on paper or in the computer, and you draw a bunch of lines at 5.4-inch centers, and then you draw some lines at 27-inch centers, oh, it all starts to fit together. And then you start, we use the Vern Clements model airplane um, shapes to give us the the wing plan form, tail plan form, profile view, that type of thing. Scaling everything to known quantities. We know we knew how big the engine was. We knew, um, you know, propeller diameters and all these things, how big the wheels were, what size tires were on it. So you use all that information 
and you might end up with seven out of ten pieces of the puzzle and then you fill in the rest with your best guess and um, and then we just designed the airframe we had some really good photographs three photographs of the naked fuselage and another photograph of the fuselage with the engine on Bob Paul standing next to it so there was there was more there than than just the photo that was there for the little quick press shot. There's if you just stare at yeah. it, you learn a lot. And and you don't it's kinda of like you and I today with the Vega Cal, you know, we look at pictures and we see everything we need to see. There's nothing more to see there. And then we get mm -hmm. to the next point in the project and we look back at that same photograph and we'll well damn, there's that piece of information sitting right there. I never noticed it before. Staring at you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also, it uh, it really helped that Williams Brothers model company measured and drew up that airplane on the weekend that it won all the races to make a kit of it. Uh, that that is what Vern uh, Clements used a lot of, and that was those are really good drawings. You know, they did they did really great work. Right. Yep, for sure. Yep, and then, gosh, what do we do? It's, our, our schedule, because I see I was in college. Jeff was running a, a restaurant business that he had. Um, yeah. I was newly married. Were you married yet? Yeah, you were married. Um, yeah. And so pretty much Jeff needed to work in the evenings, and I, need, I needed to go to school and work during the day. So Jeff would come out in the mornings and work on a punch list of stuff that we had that he could – knock out and make make pieces and sand or drill or file or whatever it was and then that at night i'd come in after you know working and going to school and then dealing with you callan after after dinner and then go back up to the shop till two or three o'clock in the morning and weld pieces together that jeff cut out during the day that's kind of how we did it about three and, and we half both years. worked together on yeah. yeah 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 we didn't have much other uh, you know life but... at the time you know, a, a tiny airplane like that, it's surprising how many tiny pieces there are in it. And I think one of the major time breakthrough advances that we had was when you were drawing it up in CAD and I was able to buy that plotter yeah. that was able to print everything full size, perfect dimensions. And I was able to rubber cement the patterns on the sheet metal to make the small pieces and that really saved a lot of time yeah when you need to make yeah. you know 500 tabs or something like that and just be able to set yeah. up and just crank them out that way worked out really Jeez. good yes yeah, before you could just send it to the laser shop and they come back in the box you know the the, the z was the first airplane that i ever had any laser cut fittings for and it was some of the last pieces it was the brackets that bolt to the, in, the the cylinders on the engine and make a little C-shape and go up to hold the cowling mounts. And I drew that up, and we took it to a place that was called Am Scott Laters at the time in Apopka and um, had those guys burn those pieces out for us. And that was that was the coolest thing ever because in the, in the time that took me just to describe it, they made these 18 parts for us, cut them out of the steel that we brought them. They burned them out. We took them, took them back, and it was like, wow, you know, look at this. I can just go right to putting it together. That was amazing. So that was, you know, we, for us, it was kind of a transition of going from paper on everything and hand cutting everything and bandsaw and drill press to getting deeper into the CAD stuff, it being available, not just at school. I had it at school, but to finally buy a copy and have stuff at home and have a computer that I could do it with. And then, you know, the plotter that Jeff got that helped out. And then, um, Gosh, you got you had the first color printer I think I ever saw it too, Jeff. Where you made those all those color mm -hmm. drawings and everything for it, uh, all the prints and everything. Yeah. He was he was doing in color, and it was just awesome to be able to see that. So, what are some changes that you you guys decided to do for the replica versus uh, what the original was? Well, it's got a World War II vintage engine because. The parts are availability and reliability. It's got the ham standard constant speed propeller. Um, and there's part of the reasons for that, for both of those two items, we know they're heavier than than the original engines were, but the airplanes, all those airplanes had a real FCG problem. And there's they used to just put 
sheets of lead on the firewall to get the thing to balance whatever it took and so those numbers you see of the original weighing 1450 or whatever it was that's bullshit because it, there's no way it could it could weigh that and balance the way that it was it would be super tail heavy it wouldn't would work so they had a bunch of ballast in the thing uh, so that kind of helped with that we had modern wheels and brakes cleveland wheels and brakes similar wheels and brakes that you put on a 310 Cessna or a beach stagger wing um I had you know toe brakes instead of having the the cable brakes that came up and hooked to the stick and you you know you pull back on the reins and dig in your heels sort of a thing. Um, did have a electrical system in it and a starter because at that time there was a real big push. People were not allowing any hand propping to happen at airports, so yeah. they didn't want to, have to deal with that. Um, instead of the tail skid. We made a tail skid that looked like the tail skid, the leaf spring, but it had a very small four inch diameter lockable tail wheel um, buried in the, skid, in the skid fairing. So it would swivel to taxi, but we knew we'd be operating on pavement. We didn't need to have a skid back there for that. Um, also, Kevin, the aileron um, actuation system. We're not 100% sure that the Z had that crazy A-frame torque converter thing that you built a replica out of with toothpicks and straws that I still have someplace. Yeah. Uh, but it probably did. And, and we decided that we wanted to try to reduce slop as much as possible, yeah. you know, in the, in the ailerons. Yeah. So it didn't, it didn't have a shifter link U joint out of a Ford model T. It actually had yeah. aircraft rod in bearings to connect things up. And of course, modern fabric, uh, is on the airplane everywhere except the interior. I can remember Jeff, uh, you and I racking our brains okay. trying to figure out how the hell we're going to make the fabric on the inside of the fuselage because the interior sidewalls are covered with fabric on the original airplane. And on those notes that Primo took, it said, you know, the fuselage frame was black, unpainted, rubbed down with lion oil, gave uh, uh, gave black color. So it wasn't actually painted black; it just looked black. And then it said, uh, cotton fabric on the interior three coats nitrate dope or something. And so we're sitting there, we're trying to figure out how the hell we're going to make the Dacron that we're going to put in here, the polyester fabric look like cotton. And then, you know, all of a sudden we realized, duh, you know, we could just put cotton in there and it would look just like cotton. So we actually got some aircraft cotton fabric and put that on the interior. So Yeah, you assured me that we were going to be able to shrink that up nice. But when you put the first dabs of dope on that, I looked at it. it remember, it just like went completely limp. It looks yeah. so horrible. Yeah. I can't believe that it shrunk up enough. Yeah. <laughs> it worked eventually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, Cal. I mean, the, air, the original airplane had stainless steel um, Hartshorn flying wires on it. We we had McWhite brand wires. So that's who we could make them at the time. But that was all the same, same size wires. Uh, what was a, kind of an interesting little tidbit is, you know, Delmar and Steve had built the, the R2 before we built this airplane. And so um, at the time, Steve was a, you know, at his shop, he was a dealer for McWhite wire. So he could get a little bit better price than just calling up on the phone. So um, I was going to order my wires through Steve. So I figured out all the links. We measured it all up. Jeff and I put the whole airplane together, and we're mocking it up, measuring up the length for all the wires. And I send them to Steve. And we could have adjusted the lengths of the wires just a little bit, the lengths of the fittings here or there. And the wires would have been identical to the, the, the lengths of the wires and the sizes of the wires that were on the R2. So... And they got their information wow. from you know the New England Air Museum when they were measuring all that stuff up. So what was so to me it was really interesting that they just when they they did the Z they ordered a set of wires and when it came time to do the R one and R two they said send us two more sets of those same wires and we'll make all the <laughs> fittings long enough to make it all work. So it was pretty interesting that it worked out. I mean within That's fractions funny. of an inch of being identical. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that kind of stuff was expensive. Cool. I mean, this, you're talking about $1994, $1995, somewhere around in there. And I think it was like $5,700 for the wires. So Yeah, it was a big that, item. That was a, a big ticket item. 
we did get a lot of help from friends too, you know, um, Ron Alexander that had Alexander Aeroplane that later sold, you know, his business to Aircraft Spruce and Ron bought the Polyfiber Company uh, when it was called Stitz. Um, Ron, you know, was a supplier, kind of like Aircraft Spruce. He had wood and the, the dope and fabric supplies and everything else. And so they, they uh, donated some of the wood that we used to make the spars. They uh, think we got some help on some fabric and dope as well from them. Um, let's see. Either your dad supplied the uh, the, the, uh, four the wood right? for the these spars. They were up. Remember, they were up in the loft. Yeah, over there, those boards that were made from that. Right, right. And I, I think my uncle had the core propeller that we sent off to get done. Right. Yeah. yeah. That. And we had a lot of friends that helped us, and you know, and, um, yeah, like Jeff Morgan, who built the most beautiful ribs in the history of aviation. It's a shame to cover the airplane up. Yeah, there. <laughs> there, all the gussets were half moon shaped, all nailed perfectly. It's just absolute work of art. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so Jeff Rogers. Jeff, that was the first thing I ever did with Jeff and uh, Jeff Rogers with uh, his airplane plastics. Now, uh, we had uh, in Robin's in Robin's kitchen. I had the molds and I was forming the two pieces of the windscreen. So there's a windscreen and a halo over the top, and then a dome in the center, and um, it's all riveted together plastic. And, and I, I couldn't make that dome. I, I English wheeled the shape, made it, and metal, but in aluminum. But I didn't. I couldn't form it. I didn't know have the skills and know how to form that dome piece, um, so I um, I contacted them and talked to Jeff, and he said he said well send me what you got, and um, I'll take a look at it, and <laughs> sent it up there. And his first call was how'd you make the piece of metal? I can I, it, making the plastics nothing. I know how to make the plastic. How did how did you shape this a piece of aluminum to get this done? And that was you know he was all about that. So that was. That was the first thing, and he made he made two of them for us, and we managed to uh, not break the first one putting it together. We still have the second set of all the parts in the rafters. Yeah, the metal piece and the and the second piece of plastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was so you know, a lot. This airplane led to a lot of relationships and friendships outside the airplane too. So. Were there any unforeseen issues during the build or anything that was a big hurdle to get over? Yes. The end number. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I uh, <laughs> found out that the, uh, the owner of the end number, I found out who he was and got, he was kind of big in the seaplane world of EAA. And uh, the Kimballs had enough clout that, when when I said that name, they said, we'll talk to him. It was on a albatross. No, no, it was, or was a, it a widgeon? I can't widgeon remember. Or, or yeah, yeah on a widgeon. Yeah. Uh, N77 Victor. We needed this number because the FAA had cracked down. They weren't letting you put an extra V on there anymore or put a number on there that was phony, but put the real one underneath the horizontal stabilizer on the tail, you know, which previous yeah. people had gotten away with. So uh, he reluctantly, uh, he wasn't attached to it, but he just, he was the kind of guy that just didn't want to change anything. But for, we arrived at 2000 bucks, he'd sell it, the number to me. And I said, okay, well, we're a little ways out. So I'll get back with you in a couple of months here. And in the meantime, he was, he was flying his albatross, Grumman albatross um, up in, Oshkosh, and then afterwards they went up to the lakes up there north on the Canadian border, and his uh, son was tragically killed by the propeller on the on the uh, albatross, and he was impossible to reach, and it was getting down to the point. Now we had already painted the numbers on the airplane and everything. There was just no going back, and. I don't know how we finally got, I I had somebody that called him to wake him up on it, but we got that hardly in time. And then the FAA screwed up a little bit on the, uh, on the uh, airworthiness certificate or the registration. So 
Unfortunately, we had an FAA, a friend who worked for the FAA that got that straightened out pretty quick. But the end number was the big <laughs> nail biter of the whole of the whole project, I think. Yeah, I, I, I remember part of it. Maybe this is correct. I, this is a memory I have. I think it's correct that once we you did get the number and you made the deal with um, with that guy and you got the number and then all the paperwork went out to the FAA, it was like weeks and weeks and weeks and months or whatever of not hearing anything. And it wasn't like today where you can go online and just check the status, you know, you had to talk to someone yeah. and you couldn't get a hold of whoever it was. And you finally found out that whoever she was, Mary, she was out on maternity leave and all that stuff was just stacked on her desk and it had gotten, you know, kind of behind the curve up there a little bit on some of the paperwork. Yeah. And they sent me one. But the the there was a, the the serial number was wrong or something was wrong on it, and I called them and they said send it back, and then it goes back into the oblivion again, <laughs> and that's when um, Rex was his yeah. name got involved. Yeah. Um, I, I, ever since then, I always hired a title company to do anything. No, no matter how simple it is with aircraft registration, just hire somebody in, in Oklahoma City that can walk across the street and open the door yeah. and put it in front of someone's nose. That's right. That's right. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah, so the, the other replica, Katie, that was in the Rocketeer movie – it has NR seven seven Victor writ, uh, all over it too because you know it's a very small airplane but the end numbers are huge on the wing and big on the tail so it's it's really part of the scheme. It's as, the end numbers as much part of the scheme as the big number four race number on the side. So the um, that airplane was painted NR seven seven Victor, and then we're, when we started looking at it, we're like, well, how can it be there? But this guy has it on an airplane up there. And it turns out that it was in R seven seven Victor Victor, and they just never painted the second V on it, and they just kind of snuck around that way, and nobody ever caught it. It's just an old airplane. It was it was, early, it was in a successful worldwide movie, and nobody ever caught it. Well, in the movie, well, it wouldn't nobody matter. Would in the movie, it wouldn't matter yeah. because oh, it was the airplane. Yeah. The airplane. The airplane was not built for the movie. The airplane was built just like Jeff and I built an airplane because the guys wanted to build a cool airplane. And then, you know, he wrecked it, he rebuilt it, he sold it to somebody. And then that somebody already had a deal in the pocket with Disney, sold it to Disney. Disney does the movie, you know, and then it ends up back in a museum. So um, it wasn't built for the movie. It just happened to be a character they purchased for the movie. In the earliest uh, draw uh, photos of that particular GBZ replica, um, you can see uh, when uh, uh, a shot looking straight down that there's a tiny two inch second V out by the wing oh, after the giant V. Yeah. So for a while they were, that's how they got it signed off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So yeah, that was a, that was a tough one. It's like any project, Callan, you know, just like what we do today, you dread this certain thing. And you know it's just going to be really tough, and it works out okay. But then the st the little yeah. thing that you didn't even think was going to be a problem or had no idea it was ever going to show up as a as an event, that's the one that bites you in the butt, and you sit there and and work and work and work to get it to to sort out. And it's I think the biggest so, thing, and and um, you know Jeff touched on it in the in the video stuff with um, you know Ann Byers was that sticking to it, staying at it, touching it every day is really what it, what it takes to, to do a project like this. Um, if you yeah. decide to take a week off, a week turns into a month, a month into a year and before you know, it's, it's shoved over in the corner. It's a pile of dirt and you, you just don't do it. You have to touch it every day. Even if you don't accomplish something on it, you need to go, you know, keep it in the forefront. Be of in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we did accomplish some something on it every week. I mean, I don't think I, I don't think many many sessions went by where there wasn't some real progress made on it. And I I, I credit you because you're a Kevin because you're a very organized person from a timeline perspective. I mean, we didn't scratch our heads 
in the shop with this airplane. The shop time was sacrosanct. That's the time mm-hmm. you have tool about and you're making stuff. You can do your head scratching some other time, yeah. you know, like at Ponderosa Steakhouse or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's, that, that's why that airplane got done in the amount of time that it got done in. I, I look back on it and I can't believe both of us were working fo- more than full time. Yeah. I was running three restaurants, building a fourth. You know, I mean, I was working 60 hours a week. You were in school and working full time yeah. and you're married and you're starting a family. Um, it, it's unbelievable when I look back on it. You, there, there, there's those years in your life that you look back on that are hyper productive, where it's like every week is like a, a month, you know, and every yeah. month like a year. And I thought that that would go on forever in life, but <laughs> <laughs> somehow it doesn't. Yeah, somehow it doesn't. Like <laughs> yeah. yeah, just just to think of the the seventeen other things we would have done by now if we were still going at that rate. But you know, you can't oh you can't God. do it forever. You know. No, it's definitely yeah. not sustainable. Yeah. And it was driving. I, my I mean, my house was thirty five miles away from your shop, where Ooh. we built. 80% of it, and I covered the airplane at my parents' place, which is 55 miles away. I was driving. <laughs> I was on the road. I was either on I-4 or 441, you know, all the time I wasn't working on the airplane. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> either in the Isuzu Trooper or um, what was it? The inf- what was a little 30, the little J-30 car. Oh, that Infinity. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just... All, it, it, it almost looked like Jeff was an employee at the place but, uh, because he, his car was there more than a lot of the guys that worked there. But we were busy. We stayed at it. That's for sure. So what, what was the total um, man hour count? About 4,500 man hours of shop time. And as Jeff said, there wasn't a lot of thinking at the, at the workbench kind of stuff. We, we, we would plan yeah. things out and we would do it. So it was about the same number of man hours it took them to build the original. And then there was probably around 1,500 hours of computer and CAD time. You know, I did some of the earliest finite element stuff I ever did on the structures on the wing and the fuselage. And so we all that kind of in there. And then there's probably thousands of other hours of researching, thinking, discussing, you yeah. know, hours on the phone with each other, that kind of thing. So... Yeah, you know, actual working time, if you want to add design time and, and build time together, probably close to 6,000 hours. And we did that in um, you know, four years. Um, you know, we did, you know, Jeff, Jeff um, Morgan built the ribs. Um, Willie Carter built the tail feathers to our drawings. Um, and that was just saving us some time while we were, Jeff and I were concentrating on building the fuselage. So that's why there's some, some cool pictures of Jeff holding up, you know, we get a, a, a piece done and Jeff's holding it up. Yeah. And then, um, or, or trying the fuselage on, you know, for the first time when we had it all tacked together. Yeah. Sit there and make airplane noise right. for the first time. That's right. And there was a lot of, so a lot of the aviation airplane... community would learn about the project mainly because of Jack Cox, Jack and Golda Cox would come by and visit take those a lot of those cool pictures you see like standing up on the bench looking down on it that type of thing yeah so you know jack jack was a really good guy ran the ea magazine and um, a couple others and and he really was instrumental in getting the word out on what a lot of people were doing with with cool old airplanes yeah i mean at the time it probably wasn't a whole bunch of super cool airplanes like this going on i mean it was the z and you know, probably some stuff that Yunkin was doing, but not like a dozen cool projects. So it was, it's kind of one of those cool things that people really want to see and, and hear about because it's a cool old airplane. Yeah, what what Steve and Delmar did was really, I think, brought more attention to the that era of airplane than anyone yeah. before because you know there were there was a Waddell flying. A second Waddell almost flying. There was Mr. Mulligan, a couple of Mr. Mulligans, right? Jeff had been done. Um, yeah. uh, Traveler Mystery Ships, there was a couple of those. Uh, just a lot of 
a lot of those, that era of airplane, and there were some real ones too. I mean, some of the clipwing monocoops were still around. So there was stuff out there to, yeah. to turn the crank. But when, you know, when Delmar started going to the air shows and demonstrating that airplane and, you know, I remember seeing, you know, that first year he was at Sun and Fun, he's sitting there kind of where the gate is, um, where you cross out to the, uh, like to the antique area where there was a gate across the taxiway right there. And, and he was sitting right there and he's sitting in the chair underneath the wing and he's got a box full of posters and, I went over there and bought a poster because I thought, you know, and had him sign it and gave it to you, Cal, and it was in your room forever. And, and it was one of those things that, well, I'm probably never going to see this guy fly this thing again, so I'm going to get a poster while we can. And, um, yeah. you know, little did we know he was going to fly it for that many years and 1,600-plus hours of flying the thing. So pretty cool. Yeah. So when was the Z finished and first flight? That kind of stuff. Let's talk about flying. Yeah, it was June June of 96, June 11th or something like that. Not sure. Somewhere around in there. Um, maybe a little bit. It was like 97 degrees with 97% relative humidity. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. an unbelievably hot day, humid day. It was. Uh, and it had that Sahara dust, you know, that blows over to Florida yeah. in the summertime. So visibility was... It was over three miles, but not that much over three miles. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, real hazy, real hot, nasty. We were at Leesburg Airport. Um, we had um, Gene McNeely came over with his T6 to, to fly Chase and be the, the camera plane. Um, I think that was on the second day, right, when Gene came over. Yeah, that was the uh, second day. And Anne's camera was so heavy. She couldn't manage it in the slipstream very well, so yeah, <laughs> she wasn't able to do much uh, film footage on that. Yeah, and and Byers, yeah, the camera, did, did all that all that film footage, the interviewing of all of us, everything, and um, she was about you know the size of my sister, you know, probably under five feet tall, a little yeah. bitty thing, and the camera was you know the size of a Buick, so it was pretty tough <laughs> to, to manage. Um, but she did it. She's yeah. pretty awesome. And then, uh, let's see, we flew it. Delmar was here a couple of days, a couple, three days, flew it. Um, 12 or 14 flights or something like that. And um, and then there was, you know, some plans to do a few little things to the airplane. It had it had a spot on the, on the one wing, the left wing, Jeff, that was... The, yeah. the uh, yeah. just outboard of the wing root fairings, that, like the the adhesion of the the butyrate dope and everything was coming loose in the fabric, and you could see it lifting up like a bubble. So at first, so we weren't sure if that was the dope or the fabric. You know, we weren't a hundred percent sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't know if the fabric was so getting weak kind of... or what was going on. So that's why we we stopped, and then um, it took the wing off and. And uh, Jeffrey covered it, and it turns out it was the. Oh, dope. really? Okay. Yeah. But. Oh. Uh, and then. So after the. Then, then it was what? Gosh, that was that would have been late that year of ninety two, no ninety six. So then. Yeah, and then Herb called us and said, you know, he he needed us to get it out of his hangar up there at Leesburg. Yeah. So that's when I went, I mean, I was, I was up uh, at a year pass at fantasy of flight. And, um, you know, I had met Kermit in the past at aerobatics stuff, but he didn't really know me from anybody else that much, but, uh, I had gotten to know Jack, you know, mm -hmm. at, over the years, some way. Um, I think they came in for dinner some night or something. I invited him he and his girlfriend in. And anyway, uh, so I, I was over there and I was literally trying to find a place to put it where we didn't have to pay for hangar rent. So I asked Jack, I said, you know, you know the Z, how do you think it would do over here? Well, what if I put it on loan? And uh, he said, I'll talk to Kermit about it. And Kermit uh, was very reluctant at first. At that point, he did not see the golden age as part of his vision at all. And uh, so... Uh, but they let me, they let us bring it over there and we put it together and it wasn't long before 
it was like getting all the attention. I mean, uh, it was it was undeniable that people were stopping and just staring at it, you know, for, for periods of time. And that's when Kermit decided that he may want it. So yeah, then you and, and uh, what was great about playing it to him, we didn't have to worry about um, Joe Schmo wrapping it up into a ball, you know, going on the air yeah. show circuit and stuff. I remember um, yeah. the IEC chapter was having a, an event there, like a, a get together. And you and I went and, and we, we went ahead of time and got the major, the battery was fluffed up and, and all that. And you taxied it around, ta- got the Z out, taxied it around a little bit and everybody was oohing and on. And then, um, uh, then Kermit taxied it around, right? At that point. Or, yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of, you know, that was the, about the, the first time it actually moved under its own power when it was at fantasy was during that, that time. And there was a lot of years before, uh, Kermit decided he was going to fly it one day. Yeah. I mean, a surprising amount of time. It, I would say three years, wouldn't you? Something like that. He flew it in 99. Okay. So that's two years. Because basically, because we were working feverishly to get the model 12 done and Scott Oglesby and his son, we're up here helping out on a weekend and sleeping on our couch. And they were driving back to their place in, in Bartow, Lakeland area, and we're going down I-4 and saw this little yellow streak go <laughs> by over I-4. And then, you know, basically almost ran off the road to get over there and get into Kermit's place and drove right up in there like he owned it. And um, I can remember that there's a there's a time when Scott was right there and he's on the phone with me. And I hear it flying by, and then he gets over to as soon as Kermit landed, and he handed his cell phone to uh, Kermit. I spoke to Kermit while he was still sitting in the airplane. Kermit has a video of the first flight that he did, the flying he did, and on, there is Oglesby in the video, and he's on the phone still sitting in the cockpit on on this gigantic cell phone that's just <laughs> like a briefcase. Yeah, you know, that. <laughs> yeah. when they, when he was flying it that was the That's that cool. was the call like, iPhone negative 20 yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah so, so was there was there any after the first flight the first couple of flights was there any um adjustments any kind of thing that you had to do before the next flight before Delmore flew again it was it was wing heavy one direction a little bit um i forget which way it was just a little, you know, if, Not you, much, no. if you let go of the stick, it would just slowly roll over. So I made a one, one turn adjustment on the wires and it rolled the same amount the other way. So the next flight <laughs> for the, before the third flight, I went half a turn back and it was, it was good. So it was within half a turn of a, of a, of the flying wire that, you know, those, those turnbuckle type flying wires of being spot on, on, uh, on roll. Um, it was, you know, they, we were concerned that, you know, maybe we would have to make, um, the, the horizontal stabilizer for pitch trim. You could, you could do a course adjustment on that by locating the leading edge up and down in some brackets. And then the trim mechanism raised and lowered the, the rear end of the stabilizer. And we thought maybe we would have to do a major adjustment on the front end, but no, Kermit, I mean, uh, Delmar found the sweet spot for the pitch trim and basically left it there. Didn't really have to use it much. Um, he did go, uh, let's, let's, let's see, I'm trying to think about some of the speeds. Seemed like it was um, take off, and then by the time he was on downwind, he was going about 200, turning base at 160, 130 across the fence, touchdown 110. So it's it's cooking. And when you're standing in the and, middle. And it wasn't coming up to full RPM either. Right. Um uh, it would it would go up to full RPM and then come back just a little bit, like a couple hundred RPM short. Um, and uh, I forget what that was on the on the governor linkage. And then, uh, but when you're standing there, kind of midfield and watching it come in and on approach, it just looks like it's falling straight out of the sky because you know the the sink rate was pretty dramatic. Um, Did it fly much different? Than the R, R one, R two. What's the one Delmar have? R two. Um, from what I recall, D two. <laughs> yeah, 
He said R2. D2. Um, from what I recall, the, the ailerons were heavier than they are. Um, but he pretty, Delmar pretty much described it as a hot rod. You know, it just everything about it was a hot rod. So much lighter than his airplane. Yeah. He said the same well, engine. Well, I remember when he landed and we were all, we we're all, before he took off, we we're all making bets on what the stall speed was going to be. And he came in and like, okay, what's the, what's the guesses? And we're all throwing out numbers, you know, and no, it was like 75 or whatever the number. It was much lower than what any of us thought. And, but he said when it uh -huh. stalled, it, you know, it's just sitting there, everything's fine. And then the, the headrest hits you in the back of the head and you're looking at the center of the earth. So when it and yeah, you know, when we watched it <laughs> watched it stall, it's up there just kinda hanging and just like boom, it's it's on a vertical down line. It was it really went quick. Wow. But um you know, he he um it knife edged well, it did a whole lot of stuff well. Um did a lot of things that it was definitely more stable in yaw than the than the R two. The R two as a if you take your feet off the rudder pedals in the R two, it'll start wagging its tail back and forth and slamming you around in the cockpit. And that's just a, that big barrel shape doing that. So it was more stable just because it didn't have that aerodynamic influence. Um, what kind of stuff did they do on like the first flight? What was the, the, go uh, the goal with the first flight? Probably kind of like what he did with his, you know, he went up there, um, flew it around a little bit. Everything was, you know, stable, checked this and that. Then, uh, did a stall to find out where that was, rolled it, went inverted, checking the um, things there. Did a he did a Cuban eight right, Jeff? Um, looped it. Yeah, I think so. Um, um, the thing is, with a GB, you never know if there's going to be a second flight, so you got to yeah. make sure that you get everything done the first oh, flight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's yeah. the way it was with uh, with them when they test when he tested with the R two. They had a camera plane that first flight and did all those pictures to make sure that if it didn't make it back, at least they had all of that. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. And then, you know, he had all the advantage of having however many hundreds of hours flying his airplane and, you know, years, three or four years of experience, five years of experience. So, you know, I mean, where he, else he's do, the highest time GB pilot yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Where do you, where, how do you yeah. qualify somebody better than that? than somebody that's got that kind of time. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the landing, um, the style of landing that he did with the with the GBs was one that Steve Wolf told him about in flying Samson, which was rigid gear, and you know fly it in, land on one wheel, one main, and then fly the other one down, and then you know you're you're on rather than trying to grease it in and try to get both mains hit at the same time and hop and skip and bounce. So he had the, all those techniques were, were all dialed in. Um, I can remember we're standing about midway down the runway and you know, the, it was uncontrolled airport at the time. And we're on the, on the taxiway about midway down and Delmar takes off and then he breaks ground and he's just six or eight feet off the ground, 10 feet off the ground. And as he goes past us, you can see his entire face looking sideways in the canopy right at us smiling <laughs> as he went by. And so at that point he's like, okay, this is it. It's good. You know, he's already, he was yeah. he was so dialed in. He already knew what he had his hands on right then. Yeah, he was having fun at that point. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but it was it was six hundred degrees. We had we we had oil temperature issues that day because it was so hot and your brand new motor and that kind of thing. But Jeez. you know, I'd just go ahead and go fly it. We'll we'll work on that later. Now I I don't know if this is true or not but it's something that i remember and so if it flew in june katie would have been born in november before so she was a few months old i killing it yeah i never <laughs> saw it fly until we watched the videos just a few years ago for uh for hannah's and i remember being in my grandparents house which is the house i'm currently in having you guys drop me off because I was going to stay with Katie, my new little sister. And it's just an airplane. Katie was the, you know, stay with my sister. I remember for some reason, I remember thinking I'd rather stay with my sister than to go fly, the, go watch the airplane. Aww. 
Aww, which is that would definitely not happen today. <laughs> which I don't know if it. I don't know like, if that was the case. You, you know, go but to the airport. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it, we didn't. We didn't need to have you there if there, if it became any kind of a, a emergency stuff or anything didn't go right. Yeah. So we didn't need to have a, you know, three or four year old, five year old, whatever you were at the time. Yeah. We didn't need that extra worry. Robin did come later after work, and I can remember too. Yeah. We were we're all standing there, and we just finished flying. And and the airplane's back at the hangar, and everybody's doing the celebratory, yeah, you know, and, and you know everybody's slapping each other on the back and hugging and all that. And this this lady just kind of walks up that nobody knew, <laughs> and she just walks up and she says, "This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I was just driving down the highway and I saw this little yellow plane, and I had to come see what it was." And so she just kind of came in and crashed the whole thing just because you know it was she didn't know what it was. But it was right over the highway. Oh, so that wasn't that wasn't mom. No, no, no. your mother. Oh, was. I was like everything you just said tracks as if mom would have done. No, that. she was already there. <laughs> like, oh, that's just so pretty. Yeah. I just want to like that is very mom. No. Yeah, okay. Oh, the times of pre-airport security lockdown. Oh yeah, there were no gates. <laughs> yeah. You could just drive up in there and you know, like you own the place. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that was it. So. There's a lot of things that we did. I mean, this this airplane had, um, uh, you know, not only was it wood tube and fabric, but the the wheel pants were. You know, we we carved the foam plug. We made the concrete molds ourselves. We hammered out all the pieces. We made all the the fairings, one the wing root. Jim Yunkin. We were running out of time for to get to the Sun and Fun for a static display, and I'm talking to Yunkin and said. We're just gonna you know, we're gonna go without the cowling. We just don't have it done yet, and uh, that's when he said, "You start making all the mounts and do all that stuff. I'll make the nose bowl." And so I sent him a drawing of the nose bowl, and he Jim Young formed the nose bowl skins for us, and then we got those back. We had already made Jeff and I had made the the cow buck a wooden form to build the cowling on. We already had that done, and uh, you know, not unlike when Steve and and uh, Delmar went to Oshkosh that year with the with the R2. When Jeff saw it in '91, the paint was on the cowling was drying in a trailer as it was going to the show on both of the airplanes. But um, <laughs> yeah, it looked it looked good. Nobody knew the difference, uh, but it it uh, definitely needed to have the cowling on it to go to the show. That really kind of made the look. Yeah. And then once we we put it all together at Sun and Fun, and um, Jeff, you taxied it a couple times back to the to the hangar and back as we kept it inside sometimes. Yeah. One thing about that airplane that, uh, I would never have predicted. Maybe I should have was that how much heat that engine, uh, radiated into the cockpit. Mm. It was once that thing got warmed up the whole way. I mean, it was like the sun up there. You could not believe the heat that was coming back. Of course, there's a hundred, gallons of gas between you and that heat too right. which you're always thinking about but uh and, and also the amount of exhaust that you would smell whether the canopy was on it or off it uh, that would have been something that would have had to have been addressed eventually because that all that lead would would really be bad yeah. to be ingesting yeah. all the time i remember a cool night when we were running the engine at night up here jeff remember that we had the cowling off and yeah and we're running it at night and seeing all the the blue exhaust flames coming out and going, you know, coming out around the nine individual stacks around the airplane. That was cool. But yeah, that's about, about that. But it was, it was just, uh, <laughs> just a, a lot of work and it was a lot of fun and, um, definitely glad we did it. You know, we, you know, we, we became yeah. good friends. You know, Jeff is, you know, Katie's godfather. So, you know, there's some family tie in, in all this eventually from everything. And every, we're pretty, He's my godfather. Yeah. Also, He's Kevin, like, I, I... You come to me on the evening <laughs> my daughter's wedding. I, I actually think that the airplane was somewhat of a catalyst that put um, your company uh, onto a new trajectory, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, because it... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely was a project that you and I did together. It wasn't a company project at all, but the fact that it occurred here and we had so much, you know, family involvement and everything, I think that it definitely 
help boost the company quite a bit. Well, it wouldn't have been possible had you not seen all the airplanes that you had restored up until that point. I mean, you know, you, you just knew how stuff had to be on it, that someone that didn't have all that experience would just be be looking at a, at a blank piece of paper and saying, you know, I wonder how we should do this. Right. Yeah, true. So, you know, I, the, the company tie in there was absolutely priceless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you should see the, the tools that we used uh, <laughs> to, to build it. It was, <laughs> it was Jim's toolbox and it was just like any other toolbox, nothing like what you have right now. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have, we didn't have. I think they just, did you just get rid of that one toolbox that y'all had for forever? No, the, the toolbox that the <clears throat> we used, the tools and toolbox that we used in the time of building the, the Z were, it was all <laughs> stolen. That's when they stole the, y'all's wagon oh. and stole, stole all of my our wagon. tools. Um, stole yeah. the, the welder. Stole your wagon? Yeah. Yeah, they stole yeah. all this stuff. Oh, so man. all that's gone. But, um, but yeah, it was. It's like we were talking about in you know, another one of these discussions that we had a earlier show, where you, you, the fact that you know how to do something the hard way, and by hand or whatever it is, you you get it done with a, a piece of a log and a and a pipe and a and a hole in the ground, and you still get it done. When you get a a better tool for doing that job, you understand the genesis of it and how how to get there, what yeah. makes it work. And we did a lot of stuff a long time the hard way at work and on this project as well and you know we i've told you before cal to be guys that walk through the shop and kind of take an inventory of everything we have and think that's what they need to buy to get started and no that's that's where you're at after you're 30 years into it or 40 years into it yeah it's not what it takes to get started so it's uh it's it's just one of those things where you just look at the tools you have and figure out how to make it well, I I really appreciate uh, Jeff coming on and and talking with us and reminiscing a little while and um, it's it's pretty cool to to hear stories that I was alive or Katie and I were alive but weren't old enough to to hear it you know from the horse's mouth so it's it's kind of cool to to hear all that experience at so it's uh, I really appreciate it coming on. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity. And and Jeff on. On behalf of the show, we we apologize for Callan calling you a horse. And, uh, well, that's an expression. We, a very we, we old horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we hope you guys enjoyed this episode with our trip down memory lane. As always, we are going to have a corresponding uh, blog in the show notes for you guys to click. And on this one, um, I found a, a good bit of footage that they were talking about earlier in the episode um, from the first flight day and a few old school interviews that are not newsreels. Thank you, Dad. (laughs) Um, But you guys can check them all out there. Uh, We're going to have a lot of good info on there. And if you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you can, leave a little five-star review for us. Thanks so much, guys. Good night or good day or whatever time of day it is. Thank you. (laughs) Bye.